Today I'll be leaking a law book which centers around the hive, it's twice as long as the previous video's book, Stars Above and the Blade Between. So grab a snack and get yourself in a comfortable position. I'm also going to use a different, more slow-paced text-to-speech reader as Brian tends to rush through things very quickly. But as all text-to-speech bots up, the reading will be quite lifeless, which doesn't do this piece of literature justice as it's packed with emotions, it would be nice if I actually have voice actors helping me, but it is what it is, the link to this book will be in the description. Solze Telos presents The Lament of Sirim Compiled by the Emerald Scholar The sound of birds is a common occurrence within the nested corridors of the great hives. I've woken up to these chirps countless times within my decades spent within them. Though tomorrow I travel to another. While the construction of Great Hive Eritel is still ongoing, my party of life with scholars has been tasked with a mission by Hive Lord Sai Magdiri himself. By the next star set, we shall begin our departure to one of the eldest great hives known to my kind. The first. Some consider this a pilgrimage of sorts, as other hive kin believe the first to be as reverent as holy ground. The beginning of our society. To experience this journey myself is exciting to say the least. Though, I do ponder the morality of what's to come with our task. I trust in Zymek's guidance. His bravery has brought us this far. But I cannot help but worry nonetheless. While I'm lost in such thoughts, a small bird approaches. Small and fragile. Look at you, I remark, kneeling to get a better view of it. The bird hops toward me, round in shape and colored a bright red. I hold my finger out to touch it. But just as I almost can feel its soft feathers, it flies away. You never learn. Ikosa. A familiar voice calls out to me. Although I'm puzzled at first as to where. I look around for a moment until I hear the voice again. Behind you. Fool. I quickly turn around and see Remes standing over me. His mask gleaming from the rays of the sun. For some esteemed scholar, you're not very bright of a woman. Ikosa. He remarks once more as if his previous comment wasn't enough. Quit it. I simply want to appreciate these fleeting things. I reply, turning away from him and gazing toward where the bird once sat. And this little one got away too. A shame. I sigh, beginning to stand up. He's always given me a tough time. Though it's a caring sort. So I do not mind too much. Did you pack your bags? I ask him as I collect my belongings. Little scraps of paper. Ink. Garments. And various ether-based snacks, if needed. I. Last night. It took me quite a few hours. You don't seem to be bringing that much dough. Why's that? He asks half honestly. Then invasively peers over my shoulder. I bump him away with my arm. Closing my pouch with my belongings inside. It's not exactly a vacation. We have a duty entrusted to us by Lord Zymek himself. Take yourself more seriously. Remus. We only need to bring what we need. I calmly assert myself. Although he is testing my patience already. All right, all right. He mutters as he backs off. Be at the docks by Starset. I'll be waiting for you with call. And please. You truly should bring more with you just in case anything goes wrong. Whether it be with our task or what follows after. I don't want to see you with a crack in your mask. Ikosa. He speaks in a much more stern tone. 
It's almost jarring seeing him change attitude so quickly. Understood. I reply quietly. Although I do ponder his anxiety. It's not like him to worry this much, or perhaps. He simply doesn't show it to me often. With my pouch on my hip, I head off to my quarters to pack additional supplies. Star Eyes arrives. And I've already begun packing once again. In addition to my previous items, I'm entrusting the last remaining compartments of my pouch to a small stiletto for protection. As well as a shard of Redder's mask for good luck. To hope we'll meet again. I mumble quietly to myself as I tuck the shard away into the darkness of the pouch. Gazing out the window, I watch birds on the branches of the great hive outside bring their children to rest within their little homes. A future anyone could wish for. I muse to myself, observing the mother bird care for her nestlings. A future I had wished for, yet duty steals me from. Perhaps one day, I get up from my wooden desk chair and sit on the bed too small for any grown hive king. Outside the window, the birds hate to sleep. So, little birds, I suppose I shall too. Familiar chirps greet me from my restless slumber. As it seems Starset had come sooner than expected. Good morning to you as well. I look out the window. Though no birds are to be seen. The chirping must be from around the corner. Perhaps. I raise myself out of bed. Although too fast perhaps. As I stumble my way toward the window. Peering out both sides. I look for any signs of my familiar friends. The source of the song. Yet. None are to be seen. Odd. No time for such matters. Though. I shake myself awake. Getting dressed and preparing for the voyage to come. Picking up my pouch. I realize it is still lightweight. I pray that Remes won't make an issue out of it. Lest we worry about such frivolous things for what's to come. Fashionably late. As always. Remes remarks as I step onto the docks. Though it's quite difficult to hear him over the roar of waves crashing into the grave's roots. Call shakes his head. Patting Remus on the back. Relax. The ship is here. And all three of us are here too. That's all that matters. Call calmly says. Trying to make Remus control himself. I suppose. Remus looks over to him. Then to me. And sighs. Fine. Let's just get going already. All right. He mutters as he walks onto the ship. Call shrugs. Looking at me with a puzzled expression. I don't particularly understand what his issue is. He's a different person when you're not around. He says looking off at the sea. I brush it off. It's fine. Call. Really? And how have you been? It's been weeks since I last could meet with you. I smile looking toward him. But his gaze doesn't shift from the sea. He's always seemed troubled. Keeping to himself. But today seems particularly different. A few moments pass in which he doesn't say a word then moves to board the ship with Remus silently. You make it really hard to get to know you better. You know that. I mumble to myself as I follow Carl aboard the ship quietly. Hours have passed on the sea. And our party has sat in silence within our chambers. I cannot help but wonder what is troubling these two so much. 
Have I missed some sort of argument? Did I say something wrong? What's with the quiet? You too. It's not like the both of you to stay silent for hours on end. I finally break the silence in the room. Watching the both of them jump in their seats from the startle of noise. Has the reality of this not set in on you yet? Ikosa. Call us sternly. Looking toward me with a fierce look. His hand rests on the wooden desk. Tapping it in frustration. Well. Trying new things is our job. Isn't it? To be one of Zymex scholars is to discover the unknown. I hastily reply, somewhat unnerved by Cole's frustration. He must have noticed the anxiety in my voice, and he relaxed his tone. Look, life with may be the future for our technology, but this, this unnerves me. Ikosa. It makes me scared. It doesn't feel right. I look down at his hand resting on the table, watching him grip it nervously. I glance over to Remas, who's idly looking out the seaside window of our chamber. Then I gaze back to Carl. I speak calmly, responding to him in a manner that suggests no offense. I look. I know. I understand. I really do. I know people within our great hive are calling it necromancy and other foul things. But I trust Zymex's judgment. Even more so. Because it's Sirin. I get why they're concerned about us. But even so, we shouldn't be so low-spirited due to what our peers have said about our duty. By the time we finish our task, whether reanimation is successful or not, we shall come home and all will return to normal. Think of it just as any other of our previous duties. We are going to be fine. Silence returns to the room following my attempt at cheering them up. A moment passes, and Remus looks over at me. It's not every day I get to hear someone claim using necromancy to revive a hero is any other duty. What's next? Are you gonna tell me that Reda is waiting at home for you, too? He lets out a sly laugh. And I have to resist the urge to slam the table. I slam the table. Gods below. You're something else. I shout as I get up from my seat. And hastily rush out of the chambers. Slamming the door behind me. I can't stand him. These people. The way call does nothing. I, ugh. I run to the deck of the ship. Leaning on the railing as I catch my breath. I turn around. Cross my arms and look off to the eternal blue surrounding us. I can't. Just. I sigh peering off at the waves, somewhat misty-eyed. I rummage through my pouch and find Redder's mask shut. I hold it high, and I can feel myself shaking, staring up at it. I know you're still here. I stammer through tears, looking at the piece of mask. I can't believe Remes would jest, he knows they were important to me that they are still important to me. I clutch the piece of mask and fall to my knees onto the deck of the ship, looking down. I hear a door faintly open in the distance, then close softly. Quiet steps approach me, and I haven't the energy to look up. What is it? I cry out. Unsure of the person behind me. A moment passes. 
And I've been given a response of great silence. I turn behind me quickly, expecting to see Remes mocking me once more, only to see nobody at all. This way. This time. A voice on my right side speaks softly, sitting beside me, considerably more calm than before. Remes. I don't want to talk to you right now. I attempt to say flatly, though my voice is still shaky. He sighs, placing a hand on my shoulder. I know. I'm sorry. That was, that was too far. He mumbles quietly. It's clear he feels guilty about it. I didn't mean for that to come out. Or to even think like that. Just sometimes I get caught up in that mask. You know, that image of the creepy Vesperian making light out of everything. But that was too much. I'm sorry, Ikosa. He finishes his apology and awaits my response quietly, looking off to the sea just as I am. I know he doesn't mean to act out like this, but it still hurts. But I don't want to hurt him either. I wait a moment and take a deep breath, exhaling. I forgive you, Remus. He takes his hand off my shoulder, and we sit together quietly. Waves bellow into the side of the ship. As we sit together, with no words spoken, the moon sigh rises above the horizon as the sky slowly grows dark. I'm going to head to bed. I stammer out, holding onto the railing of the ship's deck as I stumble upon my feet. Remus looks over and nods solemnly, then quietly replies, "I'll be sitting here for a while longer." Rest well, Ikosa. Tomorrow will be difficult. And thank you for forgiving me. He looks off to the waves once more. I can't help but feel a little bad for him. While I have forgiven him, I do not think he has forgiven himself yet. I nod to him and return to our chambers. Paul is already asleep in his bed, and I lay down upon mine, staring up at the ceiling for a few moments. I hold Rudder's mask shut up one last time, contemplating it, then putting it back into my pouch. A great deal of time passes until we arrive at the first. As the day is finally upon us. My party and I are anxious but ready to get this over with. Allow me to lead, please. I've been around here before, and some must here know me already. Cole speaks as we are led up to the deck of the ship, observing the massive great hive ahead of us. As the ship draws closer to the dock, Remus looks over to Cole and asks. And you're sure they won't require some sort of identification or something? I doubt they'll believe us if we claim Zymex sent us without any proof. Cole smiles and shakes his head, peering off to the dock in front of our ship. They know we are coming. Believe me. Elegant branches stretch across the sky above us as the great hive looms overhead. They said the first was grandiose, but this, I never could have imagined. I chatter to Carl as he leads us toward the plaza. The volume of birds chattering here compared to our home great hive is one of the first things I notice as we walk closer within. And other hivekin travelers pass in and out. Grandiose is an understatement. Ikosa. You're lucky to have me guiding you too, or else this would be a much longer trip than planned. 
Call laughs as we move closer to the plaza. As we draw nearer to it, a tall Ganymede god walks toward our group to stop us, peering down at us. I. We saw your shape. The docks only open to select groups at the moment. What's your purpose? Here. The god bellows sternly. His bright eyes staring into Rima's mask in particular. You look, no. You're not him. The god begins to say. Then shakes his head. Turning to call. I don't understand why these gods always try to talk to Rima's or call before me. I dash call begins to speak. Before I interrupt him. We are life with scholars, sent by Hive Lord Zymac Deary of the Second. We are here for Searing. If you'd please guide us. The Ganymede's bright eyes blink twice. Evidently puzzled by the statement for a moment. Before the realization hits him. Uh, you're that group. His expression shifts to something much grimmer as he looks off to the side possibly looking for someone else to deal with us. I didn't expect a warm welcome for what we're here to do. So I'm not too surprised. A group of guards leads us up to Sirin's memorial. And the room falls silent. It seems we are expected. The statue of Sirin is massive, towering over all of us. I stare up at the statue, Looking deeply into his mask, it feels eerily familiar. But I can't put my finger on why. Rima strikes forward and then faces toward me. Taking a dramatic pose as he begins to speak. Surely. You've heard the tale of Sirim. The star set blade. One of the guards chuckles. While another looks annoyed. No. My good friend. I have not. I hastily respond. Laughing as I play along. Call buries his head into his hands out of embarrassment. The stories are true. You see. Searing. The bravest of the ancient Hive Lord's warriors. Rose above all others when the Hive was in the direst of circumstances. Indeed. He drew his blade against the blasphemous Etrian invaders who sought to steal our life with artifacts ages ago. Oh. How he defended the hive and its glory. Gods below. Rest his soul. Remus finishes his speech. And I cannot help but laugh along with him. Thank you for the history lesson. Dear historian. I collect myself and look over to the guards standing around us. Some remaining stoic. Then my gaze drifts over to an interesting metal structure nearby. That shape is odd, and the size of this structure. What is this? What's this over here? I've never seen anything like this. I approach the immensely large metal door. It's cold to the touch too cold to the touch. And I sense nothing. That is what we call the lifeless chamber. One of the taller guards responds. Walking closer to me. Gods below. Why is everyone here tall? This used to serve as a prison for rope life weavers in a time long past. Though. We needn't use such constructs anymore. He continues. And I stare at the door. Could you elaborate? May I look inside? I look around for a handle of some sort to open the door. Asking as I peer around. The guard looks over to me slightly puzzled. By all means. It's constructed entirely of iron.
devoid of any material a life weaver could manipulate. Although, if an Ayazina were in there, it would not be secure at all. But I digress. No sort of life weave can be used there whatsoever. The guard continues to explain as I look up, observing a conspicuous button near the door. Now, is this? I mumble to myself, reaching up to attempt pressing it. Although I cannot reach it. Lovely. Need some help. Remus approaches the guard and me. Eyeing the button I was struggling to reach. PFF. He scoffs. Hitting the button with ease. A loud click echoes throughout the hall. As the large iron door slowly lowers. Revealing an impressively large. Empty interior constructed purely of iron. Wow. I step into the room. With each step making a loud metal noise ring throughout the chamber. It's cold. And I begin to understand what the gut meant by it being devoid of life. It feels so empty. Compared to the life of the great hive. I mumble to myself. Walking deeper into the large egg-shaped room. And dark. Call shouts over by the door. Looking into the chamber with Remus. If you're done now, I'd like to get our job here over with. Remus calls out to me. And I gasp and rush back to the door. God's below. Apologies. I get caught up in new things quite easily. I follow him and call out. Back toward the group of guards. It's fine. Ikosa. Honestly. Let's worry about the hot part. It's time. The guards of the first guide us to Sirin's chamber of rest. A large metal coffin resides in the middle of the room. Surrounded by a countless array of beautiful flowers. Oh my! Call walks forward. Crouching down and touching the flowers of the chamber. Such a melancholic place for such beautiful flowers. Tragic. He picks one up. Then glances at a gut to ensure it wasn't seen as disrespectful. Ferris of the Blossoms. H.M. An everlasting past, its stem being pulled. He respectfully tucks the flower onto his belt and nods toward Sirin's coffin. Thank you. Starset Blade. Carl solemnly speaks to the coffin. He's always been a sentimental one. Taking little trinkets and knickknacks of his travels with him to remember them by. I imagine this must feel special to him. Knowing the significance of this memorial. Remus is standing in the corner of the room with his arms crossed. Remaining silent. I presume he can sense the importance of this place too. These flowers have such a commanding presence amidst the life within this hall. The guards begin to fall out of the room. Except for one. He looks over to us and speaks. We'll be guarding the door outside. When you've finished your experiment, we'll unseal the memorial ground. He begins to exit the room. Before pausing for a moment. I personally believe this to be a grave sin against Sirin's legacy and the hive as a whole. May the gods below judge you for what's to come. He then exits the memorial grounds and the door slams shut behind him. Well then. I look toward Carl and Remus. Are you two ready? I'm nervous myself. But I don't want to show it. I want them to feel brave. 
And I want us to succeed. We can make history. Ready to head back home. Yeah. Remus gets off the wall and approaches me. Then looks toward the top of the large coffin. Call. Help me leave this. Don't worry about her. She'll dash before he can finish. I've raced over to help lift the top of the coffin. Shush. All together. Please. I say. Looking towards both of them. Call holds the east. Remus holds the west. And I begin to lift the south edge. On my count. One. Two. Three. We all put our strength into lifting the top of the coffin. Eventually managing to lift it. Oh. Gods. This is heavy. Oh. Remus exclaims as he begins to struggle and we start to move the top to the side. Just here. Here. Let it go here. Call calls over to us. And we begin to lower it on the ground. I can barely feel my arms. I sigh as we finish that process. Sitting down upon the grove of white memorial blossoms. One moment. Please. Remus sits too. And Cole simply looks down at the two of us. Take your time. Resting. Please. I don't want you too winded for the hard part. Cole speaks to us while looking at Siren's now exposed corpse. They buried him with his signature blade. How poetic. Carl chuckles to himself, then gazes at the flower on his belt. I presume I'd be the same as him. Though, I can't help but smile listening to him ruminate on such things. There's clearly a strong passion behind that sentimentality of his. He shakes his head, brushing dirt off himself. I'm just about ready. I get up and look toward Remus. And you? He looks up at me, tilting his head. H.M. I was ready the whole time, just waiting for you. He chuckles as he gets up onto his feet. Although I know that's a lie. Have you two recited the mantra before? Or would this be your first? Call calls out to us. Standing over the corpse. I can't help but note how well kept the body is. Usually. Corpses face worse fates. To say the least. I memorized it quite a while ago. I reply, looking up to call as Remus as I begin to slowly approach the body. Remus doesn't respond to call, but it seems he already has a deep focus on the body. He's usually quite carefree in such situations. Is something the matter? I ask Remus, and he snaps out of his trance. Nothing. Ikosa. Just idle anxieties. Is all. He speaks quietly, looking over from the cops to me. Anxieties. H M. It's going to be fine. Remiss. We'll be fine. I try to reassure him, but part of me feels quite nervous too. We stretch our hands above the body of Sirin and focus intently. I can sense the great life flowing within this room. From myself, my companions, and the countless white flowers surrounding the coffin. Closing my eyes, I find a vacancy, an empty pocket of life, a soulless body. When a body's soul is trapped within the depths, 
Traces of the soul can be felt in its rightful body. Even whilst the soul attempts to escape the depths. However, this vessel is completely empty, its soul is lost to the confines of the deep forever. It seems. Then, should our task succeed, what would control his body? If there's, ball, I shouldn't waste so much time. I need to focus. I focus on the vacancy. And then the flowers around me. To life with is not the act of generating new life. It is the transfer of life. This is the secret we have can live by. And is the truth of our miracle. I find a life within the memorial flowers. Observing how they act and bend. It shall suffice. With this quantity. I begin to channel their life into the vacancy. Then open my eyes. The flowers closest to the coffin wilt within seconds. Turning to a dark black. A growing black circle begins to grow around the coffin as each flower dies to the transfer. And I pressure the flower's life into the place of the soul further. I can feel my head pounding from the stress. As sweat begins to trickle down my forehead. God's below. I mutter to myself. As I redirect the life of hundreds of flowers into the place of Siren's soul. Remus and Carl are completely silent. Focusing their entire beings on this task as well. A large green pulse emanates over Siren's body. A physical sign of our life with manifestation working so far. The once beautiful white flowers below us are now a sea of wilted. Rotted leaves. And just as I fear we'll have to draw from our own life. The sense of vacancy vanishes. Did we? I lose my focus as soon as I notice it. Looking around the room. Then, at Remus and Carl. Did you two feel it too? I asked them exhaustedly. Attempting to catch my breath in between words. Remus simply nods as he draws in a breath. While Carl sighs. I did. But. I can't help but worry if that wasn't enough. He glances at the flower on his hip. Still gleaming white. Then shakes his head dismissively. Remus finishes catching his breath. Looking over at Sirin's body. Do we just wait? He asks in a somewhat puzzled manner. Supposedly expecting an immediate result. Not wait. Per se. Just keep an eye on him. Look for any sign of breathing. Anything like that. I call out to him as I stare intently at Sirin's vessel. I can almost feel something swelling within it. But it's so difficult to describe what. The vacancy is completely erased. I know for certain. All of us grow quiet. And I believe the others notice it as well. We stare at the body for a few moments. And then, a twitch. Siren twitches. Did we succeed? Call draws in a short breath, placing his hand over his mask, while Remus doesn't move an inch. I can't help but stand motionless as well. Have we? Are we necromancers? Is this heresy? No. Surely they wouldn't claim such things. Zymek himself ordered this task. But. My anxieties only grow worse at the moment. Searing. Are you awake? I find myself asking subconsciously. Watching the body begin to shift and stir. My heart begins to pound. Watching him slowly raise to life.
where I once felt that vacancy is now something else. But it doesn't feel right. There's no soul. What compels him to move? To live? Without that guiding part of us all. Call. Do you feel it too? I asked nervously to him. But I can't take my eyes away from Siren's form raising to life. I do. Ikosa. Are you afraid as well? He asks me. But at this point. My heart is beating too hard to answer. Something feels terribly wrong. There's no soul. This shouldn't be possible. With one sudden movement. Siren sits up within his coffin. He's grey. Moson mask staring at us. But through the large crack in his visage. I can see his eyes, vacant. Call approaches him. Putting his arm out in front of Rimas and me. Allow me this time. Please. You cut me off so rudely the last time I wish to speak. Call mumbles toward me. And I haven't the heart to protest. Greetings. Stars at Blade. You've laid dormant for so. So many years. And the rest of the hive is happy to have you with us again. My name is Carl. I'm one of the life weavers of the second. How do you feel? Serene. He asks the hero calmly. Evidently trying to ensure the large being stays calm. Siren begins to shuffle around more. Armor still intact. As he stands. He then steps out of his coffin. His blade at his side. Towering over all of us. I've never seen a Vespirian of legend. Yet where I should feel admiration. I feel fear at his stature. The hero responds to Siren's question with a resounding silence. Staring down at him, Siren twitches unnaturally, beginning to contort into something awful. What in the gods below? What's wrong? Remus asks while backing away nervously towards the door. And I find myself following suit. Something isn't right. I mutter to him, but I can't take my eyes away from Carl and Sirin. Carl stares up at the towering hero, not moving an inch. He seems determined, but I want to scream for him to back away. The vacancy has brewed into something horrific. I feel no soul there. Just the swelling roar of a thousand lives screaming in Sirin at once malformed and converging together into primal instinct. Sirin's eye, visible through his cracked visage, begins to bloat and swell. Call. Get away from it. Call come here. Please. Please. This isn't right. Get away from it. I shout at him. But he refuses to move at all, please. Gods below. Don't be so stupid now. Siren's body begins to bloat further with horrible. Bright green cysts. The life weave. It, it's taken control of him. But a thousand wills. They cannot. And to whom do I owe the pleasure? A bellowing deep voice breaks the silence in the room. Searing. How? He shouldn't, is it simply residual memories within the body? Siren calls out again. And to whom do I owe the pleasure? As he grows taller, malformed further into something unrecognizable. And to whom do do I owe into? Whom and and dash he begins repeating the same phrase over and over. 
faster each time, before he can finish. As he turns into a form most foul, monstrous, unrecognizable, he bloats, contorts, and cysts grow, and die within mere seconds on him. It is a pleasure to meet you, Siring. My name is Kaldash. Within the blink of an eye, Siren's tusset blade cuts Kaldash's body directly through his torso. A complete horizontal cut fully through him. A large pain stroke of blood scatters across the wilted flowers below us. No. No, 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 no. Call. Call. I scream over to him, backing further up in horror. This isn't happening. This has to be a dream. I, no. No. Remus is banging on the door to let us out, shouting and screaming that something has gone wrong. I can't. I stare at Carl, and he turns his head toward me. I'm sorry, he mutters, before his upper torso slides off of his leg, crashing into the floor. His legs separate from the rest of his body, then crumble into the flowers below. He's gone. Call is gone. He can't survive the depths. No. He. Open it. Let us out. Please. Remus slams on the door louder, screaming for us to be released from the chamber. I feel adrenaline beginning to surge within me. I... I don't want to die. I need to get out. I don't want to die. I don't. The door opens. And I leap through. The guards look toward Remus and me with puzzled expressions. Then they look inside the chamber. Their expressions shift drawing their weapons. I knew from the beginning. Necromancy is not to be toyed with. Utter fools. One guard mocks us. Stepping into the chamber and drawing his blade to Siren. You make a mockery of Siren's legacy. Depth sent. Now. I shall return you to your slumber dash. His preamble is cut short by another slash. His upper torso meeting call within the bed of wilted flowers below. The rest of the guards rush into the room. And I look at Remus, feeling my heart pound more. We need to go. Now. We need help. We need to run. I stammer through my words. Looking at him helplessly. Please. God's below. Just say something. Now. He shouts. And we begin to run. Faster than we've ever run before. Loud storms echo throughout the entire great hive. As the once constant bird chirps come to silence. The rustling of leaves falls still. The chattering of Vesperian and Ganymede ends. Fear and panic overtake the serenity of what this Hive King call home. As we spring through the guarded halls, the forces of Hive defense coming to defend the Great Hive from what we've done. One after another, we hear scream after scream of each guard heading in to engage with Siren. As another loud storm echoes through the tree as he gets further into the great hive. My heart is pounding harder. I can barely feel my legs as we reach the plaza. The people of the great hive are scattering. Word travels fast. But screams travel faster. I begin to catch my breath from the sprint beneath Siren's monument towering over the center of the plaza. 
Remes drops to the floor, panting as he collects himself. What do we do? Gods. What can we even do? He shouts, panicking as the storms continue to echo through the whole tree. I want to respond. I want to cry out the right answer. But even now I find myself feeling the same way. I look over to the direction the storms are coming from and it's close. I look around the plaza for something. Anything. That could lead us to a weapon of some sort. Gods. Anything. Another storm. I can barely hear myself think over the sound of my heart. And then. I realized. Standing across from me. Across the plaza. Lies the lifeless chamber. The cold. Lifeless prison in which no life weave can survive. Remas. Do you, do you think we could get it in there? I mutter nervously. Raising my shaky hand to point toward the direction of its cold confines. He looks over to the chamber. And then, watch the sounds of the Avenira storms. I think we can. But. It's, we have to lure it in there. There has to be something around here. Some, gods. It's only chasing people. I don't know. We could life with no. No. It doesn't work in there. Gods below. Damn it all. He begins to panic once more. Tapping his mask nervously beneath Sirin's monument. Until he suddenly stops in his tracks. A moment of silence passes. Only broken by an even closer. Loud storm. It's near. Ikosa. He calls out to me somberly. And I begin to worry. That shake in his voice isn't normal. Yes. Did you think of something? We can try anything. Please. I look toward him for some form of reassurance. Some light at the end of the tunnel. I. I can lure it in there. Ikosa. Huh. No. You. I can't let you. I can barely form any words. He would never. He can't. He. I can't lose another friend today. Please. Ikosa. It's either me or the Hive King here suffer even more greatly. He looks down at the floor out of hopelessness. I've never seen him like this. No. No. Remiss. Listen to me. I. I can go. Please. I shout at him desperately. I feel tears swelling in my eyes as the ground beneath us shakes. He doesn't look up at me. He simply shakes his head. His mind is set. And I'm helpless yet again. It's the least I can do. For call. For the Hivekin already lost. For you. I have too much to atone for. His voice grows shakier, holding back tears of his own. He would never be able to forgive himself. He'd blame himself for all of this. I hold out my hand to him. Remas. Are you truly certain? I ask him, looking toward his mask. He looks up at me and grabs my hand, replying, I'm certain. I pull him up off the ground and watch him gather his balance. I wish I could do more for you. Remiss. I wish it didn't have to be like this. I wish anything. Anything other than this. 
another stomp across the plaza i can see its shadow in the frame of the gate remus looks towards me and nods i'm going to open the door and when it draws near i'll lure it in there when it's in there with me i need you to seal the chamber behind me ikosa it's never to be opened again. My eyes swell with more tears. And although I try my best to remain strong, I cannot help but weep for him. You understood. I stumble over my words between tears, watching him begin to walk away. This all feels so, so familiar. And again all I do is watch. The feeling of watching him walk away for the final time is the sourest of them all. Remus. Thank you. For everything. He pauses for a moment. Then continues. Siren enters the plaza. Somehow more monstrous than before. His mask is split into a sea of fragments scattered across his now dozen limbs. Mouths. And eyes, all varying in size. I feel sick to my stomach looking at it. The tragedy we've created. I. A loud shout from the center of the plaza. Remiss. The beast's thousand eyes glare at him. As it storms toward him. The floor beneath us shakes violently with each step. As dust and leaves fall from the branches above. Sunbeams through the canopy high. Toward the plaza center where Remus and Siren stand. And then, he runs. Remus sprints towards the lifeless chamber's massive entrance and then hits the button nearby to begin the opening of the entry. Siren stomps increasingly faster toward Remus. As the entrance finally resides fully open, Remus dashes inside, looking behind him one last time toward me. My legs, my arms, every part of me is screaming to not let him go, to bring him back over here. But it's too late for something like that. I begin to slowly move toward the direction of the chamber, keeping a distance between myself and Sirin. As Sirin reaches the door, he struggles to fit inside. He continuously slams himself against the frame in rapid succession, until enough of his life we've ceased rot to allow him in. Once he's through the door, I approach. Remus stands within the deepest section of the chamber, waiting for Sirin to draw nearer. Sirin steps slow as he draws nearer to Remus. I reach the entrance to the chamber as Sirin is halfway through it. And I reach for the button, I can't reach it. My heart starts pounding once again. And I struggle with all my might to just damn it all. I back off from the door and take a deep breath. I need to do this. Now. I spring towards the button, leaping off the ground and reaching for the very heights I can. Up toward I reach it, hitting the button. The great hive shakes as the chamber begins to seal itself. Siren continues to pace toward Remus and I helplessly watch as the chamber door slowly closes. Remus. I scream at him one last time. He looks towards me, shaking in fear, and shouts back with the last of his might. I'm sorry. The chamber door seals shut. Well that's the end of that, what's up with deep woken lore and tragic endings? I've never seen one that ends well if I'm being honest. If you enjoyed the video, do leave a like and subscribe.
If all my returning viewers subscribed I would easily surpass 10,000 subscribers.